Greetings to all. My name is Zinzi Kosha Kagai. I trust and hope that everyone is doing well given the current circumstances. Today, I'll be giving you a brief overview of what my portfolio assignment is about. It has been a long, tiring journey, a journey filled with self-doubt and fear of not making it. But now that we are nearing the end, I am completely ecstatic and looking forward to what the future holds. I am hopeful and I trust that I will be able to execute and apply the knowledge that I have acquired over the duration of my university career. My lecturers really did a good job and they can only go so far. But that said, the ball is now in my court. At the beginning of this journey, things were very uncertain because I did not have any financial assistance to help me get through my honors year. I was very doubtful and intimidated by the thought of having to carry out and write a research project on my own. Even though we spent half of our final year in undergrad writing and doing research, I was just not confident enough because I was stepping into a new territory. One advice I vividly remember from the people that were guiding me was that the research topic does not really matter and that it is the connection you have with your supervisor that really matters. It is important to choose someone that has the same work ethic as you. This will determine the way you guys work with each other moving forward. I remember that I was very fixated on the topic I was going to choose because I wanted, to, I wanted something that I would enjoy working on. Although I wanted to do research on climate change, since this was the only topic I enjoyed in undergrad, I was excited to do research on soil moisture and rainfall on Marion Island with Dr. Natalie Hausman. I just want to give you a brief overview of what my research project was about. My research focuses on Marion Island, a South African volcanic island that together with Prince Edward Island formed the uh, Prince Edward Islands in the Indian sector of the Southern Ocean. Marion Island is characterized by an oceanic climate. In the last six years, the island experienced drastic climate change and this change will have an impact on the hydrological cycle, causing rainfall to decline in some regions. Negative effects of declining rainfall have been reported on the island, suggesting that soil moisture is, is responding to changes in precipitation. Further, my research aims to investigate the relationship between soil moisture and rainfall across different microsites on Marion Island. Formulating feasible research questions, aims, and hypotheses proved to be a challenge to me because some elements were just difficult to investigate in the honors degree scope. Additionally, acquiring data from the South African Weather Services was a mission on its own. I was taken from pillar to post and half of the time my emails were not being answered. I finally got assisted when a staff member in our GGM department finally assisted me. However, this delayed the process of analyzing my data and finalizing my project objectives. Transforming and analyzing data on Excel and the RStudio application was also a challenge for me because I was not familiar with these workspaces. Furthermore, COVID-19 was another limitation on its own. I could not have contact lectures and I couldn't meet in person with my supervisors for consultation. This led to great miscommunication. Online learning also contributed to my academic troubles. I lacked proper resources like a fully functional laptop and data for online classes and research. Lastly, due to the novel coronavirus, I missed out on the opportunity of attending the SCAR conference and the SSAG student conference that was scheduled for July at Rhodes University. These conferences are normally attended by postgraduate students from ge geography departments all over the country, and they get to showcase the progress that uh, they have made on their research work. Key moments in the South African landscape during my honors year. Firstly, the coronavirus and its impact in South Africa. COVID-19 has been the world's biggest shock to happen in years. Health services, cultures and economies continue to be disrupted. This virus is characterized by a long incubation period, high ineffectivity and detection difficulties, which have contributed to a sudden outbreak and rapid development of the epidemic. It is notable that the reach of the pandemic spreads to other areas of social endeavor. In the early months of the year, there was additional pressure placed on healthcare facilities and the number of infections increased. As such, some concluded that the mitigation measures that were put in place by the government were bound to, uh, to fail in containing the spread of the virus.
In many townships, sanitation services are in a pitfall condition, with many facilities also needing to share insufficient services. These factors make it impossible to exercise proper grooming, such as washing hands regularly and keeping hydrated, as well as social distancing. Factors important to minimize the transmission of the COVID-19 virus. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused severe damage to our economy and culture. Many South African uh, companies are facing an adverse pandemic effect, and it is clear that some firms were unable to deal with the pressures presented by the virus. Only companies that were not deemed to be critical utilities or essential services were substantially impacted by the nationwide lockdown. So only companies that uh, supplied food and healthcare facilities and so forth were able to operate during the lockdown period. The businesses that were impacted saw mass cuts and closures. Consistent with previous literature, many small companies and SMEs were already financially fragile. This lockdown further aggravated and revealed the gaps between black and white, wealthy and poor, that still exist in the South African education system years after apartheid. Children from affluent families with access to and control of mobile devices are much more primed for digitized schooling and additional private tutorials. Children from deprived families are in a more difficult place. Their inadequate access to affordable digital services and study rooms in cramped homes limits them, thereby exacerbating current educational disparities. As we battle the intangible unseen COVID-19 peril, a highly visible phenomenon of gender-based violence continues to impact women and children every day. Despite President Cyril Ramaphosa declaring femicide to be a national epidemic in September 2019, this scourge continues to sweep through the country. In our society, this scourge is pervasive and profoundly rooted in institutions, communities and traditions. It is also one of the human rights violations with major social and developmental impacts for survivors of violence as well as their families, communities and societies more broadly. It is not novel that urban environmental design and the distribution and usage of city councils and police services lead to sexual assaults. So now moving on to factors that influence gender-based violence or contribute to gender-based violence rather. We have environmental design. The nature of the environmental setting can both encourage and prevent sexual abuse. For example, Harrow Road in Johannesburg rapes occur at a very particular section, which is usually around the pillars of the bridge. There is sufficient hiding space and when the lights work, the place is poorly illuminated. In comparison, open fields become unsafe when abandoned, for example, the worst proximity. So what happens here is that uh, after certain times, people don't frequent um, symmetries. So if you are going to pass uh, through symmetries during those times, you become a target for rape or robbery. Open spaces with long grass covers make it possible for rapists or thugs to attack women, and they also obscure the attack itself. Then we have urbanization. Urbanization is known as the rapid growth of uh, the number of people living in urban areas. Urbanization can intensify gender-based violence in many contexts, particularly in the sense of urban poverty, slums, proliferation of gang violence, activity, inadequate sanitation, illegal and widespread alcohol sales, and an uh, urban climate that lacks street lighting and has isolated unpoliced areas. Substandard accommodation leaves women susceptible to burglary, rape, fraud, and abuse, with no recourse to defense, either formally or informally. Then we have a load shedding. So disadvantages of load, shed load shedding uh, include smelters and refineries taking hours to restart after a break in power supply. Traffic control system shutdowns and traffic lights cause significant congestion and a decrease in efficiency and productivity. Internet and technology dependent workplaces have no alternative but to close down. Hospitals, on the other hand, are also undergoing pressure and many government departments such as home affairs simply close down as a result of load shedding. The combined impact of the above on the country's economic potential and prospects are strongly negative. One of the chapters that I'll be discussing that has that had has had a profound impact on me is um, the issue of transport poverty in South Africa, which is chapter 12 from Tracy McKay.
So transport poverty affects poor urban residents the most, especially those living on the urban outskirts. It has hampered the willingness of people to seek jobs, access to community and social resources, and reduced involvement in urban life. Those who have jobs were forced to resign or were laid off due to severe transport difficulties. Many that have links to transport also face lengthy, uh, lengthy journeys, right? These long commutes have not only been bad for the environment, but they have also decreased the quality of life of the person. No political attention has been paid to transport insecurity in South Africa. It is estimated that more than half of urban road infrastructure is in a poor state of repair. This condition is even worse in smaller, more deprived urban areas than in metropolitan areas. The urban roads of South Africa are marked by potholes, gaps, bleeding and collapsing margins. Such conditions mean that motorized vehicles are unreliable in terms of fuel and contribute to many road accidents. Roads are in a bad condition, particularly because of high intensity rainfall events in South Africa, but also because of bad water drainage schemes. Another factor is inadequate road management. So another key debate that was summarized in this chapter was spatial apartheid in urban sprawl. One of the root causes of this urban transport problem is that South Africa's cities and towns have been profoundly impacted upon historical racial discrimination and spatial apartheid policies, such as the introduction of the Natives Act of 1923 and the Community Areas Act of 1950. So we see that most Black people are packed or are clustered uh, uh, like sardines, right, in the outskirts, right, and they have to travel to Johannesburg where they work using using trains. More recently, a significant continuing urbanization has put tremendous pressure on both the urban housing market and urban transport system. Now, for the last lab. How did I prepare for the opportunities beyond the honours degree? So my first option is a master's degree at the University of Pretoria. I have decided to further my studies and branch out into geoinformatics. This is because I want to grow and broaden my GIS and remote sensing skills in a fast-paced environment like CSIR. Hopefully, this is where I'll be based for the duration of my master's degree. The project that I intend on doing will be beneficial to me in the long run because it will expose me to the hydrology field, help me gain knowledge in analyzing and modeling hydrological data, which will place me well in the job environment at a later stage. Second option, employment opportunities. I have taken the initiative to approach small businesses or companies to ask for employment. These are companies that are related to my field of study. I have sent out countless emails which clearly state where I am in life, what I would like to learn from them and the direction I would like to steer my career in. These are some of the companies which I have forwarded my CV to, Bex Environmental Evolution Consulting MKD Group. I am currently interested in pursuing an intermediate career in environmental sciences or research. Below are my first three options, environmental consultant, scientist, or policy analyst. Like Tobler's first law of geography says, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. So this explains why my career choices are very similar. I have been applying for a lot of general positions as well, just so that I can have options. I do all of this through job sites, which include PNET, Career Junction, Careers 24, Indeed, and Government Positions. Please uh, go through my portfolio so that you can see um, all this, the, the topics that I have summarized here in depth, right? And a quick note to my undergraduate self, approach those companies, apply for those internships and volunteer work, whether they pay or not. Experience over good grades is what really matters in the real world. Keep calm, everything will eventually work out. You are doing great. Thank you.